Now to our continuing coverage of the trial of a young man indicted for murder after opening fire at a BLM protest. So I didn't do anything wrong. I defended myself. I have done nothing wrong ever in my life. I know this. And I love you. We, the jury, find the defendant, Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. Oh, shit. That white supremacist just got away with murder and, like, everyone saw it happen. You know, Kelly, the story of how we got... Huh. Well, I guess I'll have to just make a video about it. Hey, folks. It's Tristan here. Last month, we saw something messed up. A white supremacist named Kyle Rittenhouse murdered two people. He openly fantasized about committing vigilante justice. He crossed state lines with an assault rifle and used it to end two lives in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Right. I'm gonna have to make a bit of a tweak to my content in this video. You see Bob here. Say hi, Bob. Bob here has always been in the room while I shoot my videos. But after this decision, He's now got legal protection to shoot people saying stuff he doesn't like. So I'll need to be a bit more careful with how I word things. So today, let's talk about the factors which led to Kyle Rittenhouse getting away with mm, unaliving two people. But first, let's do something my colleague here couldn't possibly oppose. Capitalism. Once again, I'd like to thank the sponsors for this video who bought out the whole year Skillshare. Now, repeat after me, kids. You all know the words by now. Skillshare is a learning community where millions come together to learn new skills such as design, photography, freelancing, video, and a whole lot more. They've got classes on numerous topics, so whatever the gig economy forces you into learning, and at a price way lower than community colleges. The latest Skillshare course that I took is on making engaging videos with a teleprompter, something I'm using right this moment. And it's been very useful for at least learning how to talk to a teleprompter. I've always been nervous about using one and kind of gone back and forth between bullet points and scripts because I don't know how to sound like a person while I'm doing that. And thanks to this course, I think I'm getting better. Definitely need training, but uh, at least it, it has helped quite a bit. I've also got a special treat. The next thousand people who use this link will get a free trial of Skillshare's premium service. Try before you buy, you know? I like to deliver some value to my viewers. Thanks to Skillshare for making this such a good year for me. The story of Rittenhouse getting away with whoopsie doodling to protesters began in 1676. Hear me out. Bay, Virginia needed a source of unpaid work. So they'd find people who would work for free if someone paid their passage over. They even got some land after they paid off all their debts. This was a sweet deal for plantation owners as many workers died before their contract ended. As survival rates increased, more indentured servants, as they called them, demanded land. But even in colonial times, the land already belonged to a small elite of plantation owners. The frustration of these unlanded workers bubbled up into a rebellion. They demanded the colony take more indigenous land to give them their promised acres. They lost, but the resolution of Bacon's Rebellion did cause some reforms. It's called Bacon's Rebellion after its leader, Nathaniel Bacon, who died before it ended. But, I mean, whatever. There are two reforms I want to talk about. First, they began to rely less on these indentured servants and to rely more on slave. I can't say slaves? Okay, fine. Virginians relied more on unfree African labor. The second reform were laws about the people's rights based on their skin color. Before this, some black people bought their freedom or their master emancipated them in their will. This practice dwindled and in legal code, to be black was to be a slave. They were also forbidden from owning guns to make sure they couldn't pull their own Bacon's Rebellion. 
This regime created a caste system for Virginians. Black people were slaves in every way put at the bottom of the social hierarchy. White people who once and still did the exact same work and were also stuck in extreme forms of forced labor were free. They could own land. Even if poor, they could say that they weren't sl Yeah, sorry. This regime lasted over two centuries. The American, but especially Southern economy, grew dependent on unfree labor. Black people lived in horrific conditions, hard to even comprehend, let alone describe. Meanwhile, the plantation owners held their fortunes in keeping these people unfree. When they sensed the forces of history turn against them, they had a massive civil war rather than give up. And states rights or something. The South wound up losing the war, but the half measures in Reconstruction caused many freemen to live close to where they lived as slaves. Frequently, they lived in similar conditions to before the war. New Jim Crow laws gave them few rights. The caste system became official through segregation in every corner of Southern society. The North did plenty of its own segregation too. They just used less obvious ways like redlining to feel righteous. These laws would let the slavery era dream stay alive. American society kept black people at the bottom of a clear hierarchy. Then came the short civil rights movement. The 50s and 60s saw an organized movement for black rights like no other. Through bloody struggle, they did manage to win legal equality and to end all of those Jim Crow laws. This was a great challenge to many white people who saw these gains as a challenge to the order. You can see this anxiety in the fierce opposition to people fighting for what's essentially basic human dignity. Luckily for white folks, they sat on centuries of intergenerational wealth, wealth that they had successfully barred black people out of. Furthermore, a loophole in the constitutional amendment banning the no-no word, uh, people could still hold someone in unfree labor if they were prisoners. So they imprisoned black people at a drastic rate. They took their right to vote away if they infringed or were perceived to have infringed the law. Most have to do with how you choose to shut off your brain for a few hours. With a large number of black people in prison, they'd get tons of free labor. They could also deprive a disproportionate number of black people their civil rights. Oh, and the ability to obtain gainful employment. That's more or less how it is today. So what does that have to do with this guy? The caste system needed enforcement. People who did that committed what they call vigilante justice. By vigilante justice, they mean terrorism. During the time of the S word, watchmen and bounty hunters hunted people trying to run away to freedom in Canada or the North. They professionalized with anti-strike enforcers to become the modern police force. After the Civil War, these patrols turned into creepy groups like the Ku Klux Klan. They terrorized, brutalized, and murdered tons of black people to keep them in line. If a black person tried to vote, protest their second class status, or even get too successful, there'd be white mobs there to shove them down. Sometimes they'd take a person, say they committed a crime, and execute them. The crime was so public, they made postcards and they'd get away with it. In fact, many clansmen who did this kind of thing were the cops, the people you'd think would be the ones that stopped them. America has a long tradition of looking the other way at murder in the name of maintaining the hierarchy. And now we're starting to get why those invested in keeping black people at the bottom see Rittenhouse as a hero. Saying Kyle Rittenhouse got away with killing two people because of an ingrained idea that violence is okay but only if it keeps black people in line, wouldn't be the whole picture. Related, but nonetheless distinct from that, is the role of the gun. The gun's been there from day one. It was there to suppress the unfree migrant workers. It was also there to make a continent of indigenous people empty for white settlers. The gun is power. This is an excellent time to remind you that one of those post-Bacon's Rebellion laws 
was a ban on black gun ownership. Today, the wildest double standard in American gun talk is the difference between how Americans talk about white gun owners from my cold, dead hands and black gun owners. Philando Castile's girlfriend says he told the officer he had a licensed weapon and was reaching for his ID when he was shot and killed. Rittenhouse's lawyers argued self-defense for why he had to shoot two people. Many American states have permissive laws about killing people in self-defense. But white people always get a much more sympathetic ear. In 2012, Marissa Alexander was convicted of an assault charge from a 2010 incident in which she fired a warning shot with a reportedly licensed gun at her abusive husband. I mean, people bought the line that Rittenhouse went to Kenosha with an assault rifle to give medical aid. I don't know, maybe he's an anime or something. I require healing. I have you covered. And the sting? Fires helpful bullets. <laughs> but why do people get this way? Why is an act of violent terrorism at a Black Lives Matter BLM protest getting support from unexpected people? To answer that, we're going to need to delve into the world of social psychology. Social psychologists believe that we justify our world to feel less uncomfortable about their place in it. They call this system justification theory. People have psychological needs that defending the status quo sates. This is even if that system hurts others, even if it hurts yourself. Their well-being is so tied to the status quo, they'll defend it relentlessly. Ever wonder why white people get so weirdly defensive when calling out racism? Acknowledging the existence of a racial caste system undermines their sense of self-worth. It threatens their privileges, so defending it as just becomes essential. Furthermore, they must justify oppression as somehow making sense. Talk to people or look at the news. They're reaching for any explanation for Rittenhouse getting away with unaliving people that doesn't involve racism. Well, now you know why. But that's not quite far enough. This is about where your average liberal analysis might stop. But, you know, I ain't no liberal. It explains why we defend the status quo in a sort of individualistic kind of way. But how about the why of said status quo in the first place? You will learn the what is racism, but often not the why is racism? To do that, we're going to need to look into our theory books. We're gonna need this guy, Carl German Santa. Santa studied the effect that economic forces can have on history. Vital for us today is a tiny bit of writing from his book, A Contribution to the Critique of Political Economy. The preface contained something special. He outlined his idea called historical materialism. So for us today, we're looking at a concept called superstructure and base. That's a mouthful, but it's really, really important for understanding how the world works. So you see here at the bottom, we have base. This is the way the economic world functions. It's how we get stuff out of the earth, how our economy is structured, who owns economic power, and who's excluded. Santa called the ways we make the things we need the means of production. The social structure of bosses and workers is the relations of production. Easy to understand, it's the material reality and the social structure built around it. Then up here, we have superstructure. It's everything in our world not made up of the things in the base. This is politics, religion, ideologies, culture, media, everything. These are products of the base. Thus, superstructure tends to support a worldview justifying economic hierarchies. They maintain and shape each other, but the base more often shapes the superstructure and the superstructure maintains the base. But the base changes all the time. Every new technology or industrial process shapes it, but the superstructure crawls behind. When the two get too far out of alignment, you see ages of strife and revolution, colonization and slavery, 
broad ideas justifying it, like capitalism and liberalism. Aristocrats struggled to hold on to their power until liberals revolutioned it from them. Santa argued that the superstructure keeping the relations of production in place causes tension. That is, until they snap, and a new superstructure based on the modern base comes into form. So, what does this all have to do with the American racial caste system? Looking at America through a Santaist lens, you'll notice that you have a group of people who own all the things. You also have a group who sell chunks of their life to get the stuff they need to survive. These owners want as much money for themselves as possible. So paying these workers as little as they can get away with is the name of the game. There are two ways a racial caste system benefits these guys in the name of that sweet, sweet cashish. The first way is that a lower caste allows bosses to exploit marginalized people even more, whether through literal slavery or wages so low they'd never escape poverty. American superstructure then blames these people for their low wages. They cite non-existent laziness or cultural problems or any other racist BS. At the end of the day, that maintains a hierarchy. Marginalized people make less and their bosses skim more off the top. The second reason is that race has kept white workers and everyone else separated. Workers as a group are then unable to work together to improve their situation. See, there's one way working people can use the fact that the whole economy rests on their work. We can simply not work. So we'll march day and night by the big cooling tower. They have the plant, but we have the power. That's what a strike is. We can also get together in organizations using our power to negotiate with bosses, using strikes as leverage. Workers of the world, unite. You have nothing to lose but your chains. That's what unions are. And in America, unionization is low. And thus, workers are weak. And all along, racism splintered the labor movement. Segregated unions, racism within the membership, and denying the extra harsh conditions marginalized people are in all hold them back. That's probably a topic though for its own video. It's also led to a lot of tension between black and brown communities and any white led movement trying to get everyone a better deal. We saw this in the Democratic Party primaries and not much has changed looking at the racism endemic in the white spaces. The defense of racist attacks by a certain white man bund YouTuber against a black YouTuber because said man bund YouTuber never learned to read comes to mind. Subscribe to Professor Flowers, by the way. Or the white online defenders of Kyle Rittenhouse. Who's who? Booyah. We came full circle. I know how to make a point. This goes all the way back to Bacon's Rebellion. One of the things I didn't tell you about the rebellion is that what made it strong was solidarity. Solidarity forged between unfree black workers and white indentured servants on the tobacco fields. But unfortunately, the post-rebellion reforms intentionally drove a wedge between them. And white people have been getting duped into this con for centuries now. Okay, okay, he's gone. This decision, more than anything, has created a chilling effect for protesters. Violent attacks are more and more typical for people protesting for black lives. Whether it be these two protesters in Kenosha, or Heather Heyer, and at least 25 people last year. This decision showed that murder in the name of attacking left-wing protesters is okay. Like so many Klansmen and cops before them, you can just get away with it. Protesters now have to weigh the possibility of getting shot for standing up. This decision will make people choose to do more violence. It's a product of the American superstructure. 
an effort to silence those who want to change the racial hierarchy. This is yet another case of terrorism used to scare black people out of their deserved rights. And silencing people doesn't make the problem go away. It diminishes peaceful solutions of opposing injustice. This is what censorship actually looks like. Now do classical gas.